what does composite hypostasis mean? And as David's pointing out, it's not, um, it's not about the terms. I mean, I'm not saying terms and words don't matter. They do matter. But what matters ultimately is what we mean by the terms and the words. That's the word concept fallacy. And so if you don't understand what hypostasis means, if you just think that it's an individual or, or uh, an, an instance of an individual or a concretization of, of, of a person or a nature or whatever, you're going to mess up because we need to start with our basics. What is nature? Nature answers the question of what, what's happening, what's going on, what's doing that thing. <laughs> hypostasis or person answers the question of who? Nature and person are distinct. This is fundamental to the theology of orthodoxy and John Damascus. It's fundamental to how you do Trinitarian theology to avoid modalism. Will or volition, this is what we mean by choice, right? Free will. When will moves, it moves according to energy or action, right? And energy and action and will are proper to nature. They're faculties of nature. They're not faculties of person or hypostasis, right? Telos is the question of purpose. Why we, what motivates us to do the actions that we do? RK principle, right? These are just common terms in patristic theology that one should be familiar with. Logos. The Logos is an eternal divine person, the second person of the Godhead who enters into time and space in the incarnation in a human nature, fully human nature, united to all universal human nature in his singular divine hypostasis. He possesses a fully human, there's nothing lacking in his humanity, but the humanity that he possesses does not have a hypostasis of its own that's created. It's only hypostasis, it's only subject, is the eternal divine person of the Logos. And this is the entire debate between Cyril and Nestorius. Now, after Ephesus, there's two more councils that debate this topic, and it moves out, as Dave is pointing about, out. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to get too far ahead if you have more on Chalcedon. I'm not trying to get ahead of you, but I just want to point out that the debate moves on to the to the question of wills and energies and what is will and energy a faculty of? Is it a faculty of person or a faculty of nature? And that's really the, the root of the dispute between us and all of the Orientals. Yes, I, as I was pretty much getting to that part, one very small important thing that I would like to add regarding the into nature's thing is that um, there are many fathers that use the into nature's formula. I mean, first of all, St. Kirill in the formula of reunion, he's, right. he doesn't have a problem with into nature's if it's understood correctly. And Cal Calcadon understands, understands it correctly. And that's within, why we don't the... haggle over the terms, but over the meaning. This is so key. Exactly. This is what everybody has a problem with. Exactly. And as you said, yeah, words and concepts, they do matter, but the con you need to look at the concept behind the words. Anyways. Uh, Severus, Severus thinks, thinks that the rootedness of energy, of energy the rootedness of will, of will is, in is in the hypostasis. How many hypostases does Christ have? Well, Severus will say only one. Therefore, there's only one, and that's tiandric. There's only the tiandric energy and tiandric will, but there's no, you know, there's no divine will. There's no human will. And not only, not only he, he, but... The rest it's of a divino-human mix, world. right? Yeah, this is... So if you, yes. if you read... Uh, uh, book three of John Damascus, chapters 18 and 19, he gives his exposition of the new theandric activity. And this is pointing out that uh, before the incarnation, there was God and there was man. Uh, God acted in the world in various ways. God became uh, present in the theophanies. But after the incarnation, there's a new theandric activity. And that's because there's now a uh, divino, divino human person right uh and that humanity is i'm not saying there's a created hypostasis there's not but he is the god man right he does possess a fully human nature and so because he possesses a fully human nature and he moves and acts through both of these natures in his singular divine hypostasis we can speak of a new the god man theandric a new theandric activity in the earth. That's exactly, it's not that confusing. It's not that crazy. That's exactly how John of Damascus exposits this in chapters 18 and 19. There's not, you can't go back and say, oh, well, there's actually supposed to be some kind of uh, um, like pseudo Nestorian view that we're supposed to vindicate. No, it's Cyril that's vindicated. And it's Cyril that's vindicated at the fifth council and at the sixth council. Uh, and it's not about monophysitism that's rejected. 
It's about the two wills and the two natures and whether will and energy are faculties of nature and person. That's the whole debate. That's why when you get to Maximus debating with Pyrrhus, that's the whole debate in the Maximus in the debate with Maximus and Pyrrhus. And he argues that, look, the energies in Christ's human nature are distinct from the energies in his uh, a pro a proper to his divine nature. And therefore, there's two wills and two energies in Christ and that the uncreated divine energies deify the created human energies and created human will. And again, the, the works of Leontius of Byzantium, they were very influential throughout this period in arguing for and vindicating diophysitism and diothelitism. Another aspect of the wills, it's Severus's view on wills is kind of confusing. And uh, uh, Joseph uh, Farrell himself goes into this and he talks about the planes of reality. For Severus, there's three planes of reality. There's the Trinitarian reality, there's the angelic reality, and then there's the material, you know, our reality. And Farrell notes that if that is the case, then you have the human will of Christ, right? That human will is, uh, it's on the material reality, and that the divine will is in, uh, it's in the Trinitarian plane. And so there's a difference of plane. So they're ontologically different. And because they're uh, because the divine will is then so ontologically superior and on a different plane, that means that one of them has to subjugate the other. And it, according to that logic, that will mean that the divine will is completely subjugating the human will outside of the outside of the free will. So another father that I would like to uh, emphasize on uh, in in this discussion is Philoxenus of Mabog and his view on crystallic. Well, before, before you do that, well, before you do that, say, yeah. let me let me make a point here just for the sake of the audience so that we remind right, people right. where where we are. So we, we went through some of these terms right before this. I did um, henosis or henotic union. That's Cyril's idea that there's an analogy between the union of body and soul in a human being and the type of union that exists in Christ between the divine and the human. So he says that that union, it's you can still make a distinction between the divine and the human, but there's the union is so strong that it's almost like the way that the soul is, uh, you know, equally dispersed throughout fully the human body. So that's his term, henosis and the henotic union, as an analogy for the way that the divine and human natures exist in Christ. And it's a great analogy, but again, it's just an analogy, so it's not a one-to-one. -one. So in the same way, uh, Cyril is very famous for the, for the idea of inhypostatize. And this is the idea that nature, whether divine or human, only exists in the tropos or mode of individual hypostases or persons. So I am this particular person, Jay, you're the particular person, David, we both share a common human nature, but what we do is that we instantiate that human nature in particular individual concretizations as the person, Jay, and as the person, David. Hypostasis is not just an instance of nature. It is an instance of nature, but it's not just an instance of nature. It also goes higher or transcends that. And that's why we're not modalists when we apply that same idea to the Trinity, which is that each of those hypostases instantiates the divine nature, but they really are distinct from one another. And they really do possess unique hypostatic properties. The son really is a son. He's not just an instance of the divine nature and the spirit, an instance of the divine nature, a mask, right? Sabellianism, but they actually, uh, you could, you could look at person as transcending nature. It's something mysterious. It doesn't mean that we can't say things about it, but as the father say, I think as Gregory of Nyssa says in, um, the concept of the divine persons, Nyssa says that even hypostasis is mysterious to us. It can't be perfectly defined, nor can usia. I mean, we can give these kind of linguistic limitations to these terms, but we don't exactly know what it is to be a hypostasis. We don't exactly know what the Paul says, what, does a man know his own spirit? No, only the spirit of God knows what is in a man and the spirit of a man. So even to ourselves, we are, are mysterious to ourselves. How much more is, you know, what it is to be hypostasis and God mysterious to us. But I mean, that's covered very well in a lot of these works. So, uh, I just get tired of really, really rehashing the same things over and over and over, because I mean, if you just get this main point here, and if you understand that the father eternally begets a son who is really a son. And that when we're participating in salvation, we're participating in a real filial relationship. We're not just being given 
uh, a divine essence. We're not just being given a divine energy. We're being given, as Palamas says, in hypostatized divine energy. That means that all the energies are personal. They're hypostatic. They're in hypostatized because the energies are proper to nature. So in the same way, uh, it applies to humans. It applies to us. And I want to, real quick before David goes into Mabug, we want to look at the, the way that John Damascus defines energy and the distinctions here, which he says are all distinct. You'll, you'll find that it's exactly what I was just telling you. Energy and capacity for energy and the product of energy and the agent are all different. Energy is the efficient and essential activity of nature, right? So energy is a faculty or, or a, a product of, it's a proper to nature, we should say. The capacity for energy is the nature from which proceeds that energy. The product of the energy, the effect, is that which is affected by the energy. The agent is the person or the hypostasis who acts. This is very simple. It's very consistent. It's consistent across the board. So if we keep that in mind, all of these terms start to make sense. Now it's a little bit of a, dis it's, it's distinct in the Trinity because the Trinity is tri-hypostatic. It's not just one hypostasis, Father, Son, and Spirit in one singular shared divine usia or essence. So it's distinct from humans, but when it comes to hypostatic acting, personal acting, even though the mode is triadic, it's still the same. The energies are, God's actions are distinct from the hypostases. The divine essence is distinct from the, the hypostases so that you can have three persons. If it's not, you couldn't have three persons. That doesn't mean that there's some mysterious essence floating out there. It means that the essence of God is always in hypostatized. If any of the heretics would just learn these terms and what they mean in our system, you can't import Hellenic definitions. They would be on our side. Just to hammer this home with what we're saying here is that what we're going to see in the triad is going to be consistent with our Christology. So if we understand that in the triad, because there's one divine nature, if will is a faculty of nature, then there's only going to be one will in God. If the if will is a, uh, uh, if energy is the action of will, the movement of the will, then we're going to see that energy is also proper to nature and that there's one energy in God in the sense of there being one source, as John Damascus says in book one. But there's also many energies because of many actions of God, right? And this is another dishonest thing that Taylor Marshall does and, and other Roman Catholics. They'll go to John Damascus and they'll pick the section in book one where he says that God has one energy because he's he's singular. There's one God from whom the energies, the energies proceed. Uh, and then ignore the sections where he later goes on to talk about many energies. And that's because there's different actions of God. Duh. Walking on water is not the same action as creating the world. Duh. And so if we understand that, then we understand that in the triad, there's three persons. The father is the monarchia. He's the uh, unbegotten arche and principle of the Godhead. He communicates and beget, he, he eternally begets the son and communicates that full divine power in nature to the son. So the son is the direct offspring of the father's nature, right? So nature is, he, Jesus doesn't, uh, generate from the common nature of God. He doesn't generate himself. The spirit doesn't generate him. He's from the father's nature. And that's very important to Orthodox theology. And then the Holy spirit comes from the father through the son from all eternity. So that's Orthodox Trinitarian procession, you could say. And then with, uh, uh, Christ. And by the way, all of the energies and actions of God, they also proceed in the same triadic way from the father through the son and the Holy spirit, right? So the creation of the world, it went this way. The experience of divine foreknowledge comes this way, right? The action of mercy in the world is from the father through the son and the spirit, right? So the economic and the, uh, theologic all have the same triadic approach. They're all the same triadic model. Or mode, you could say. Now, in the incarnation, um, Christ, who is this second hypostasis, this second hypostasis, the Son, right? I can't do that. Second hypostasis of the Trinity, the Son, took on human nature. He's a divine hypostasis, the Logos from all eternity. So he already possesses possesses his full hypostatic quality and property. But he takes on a fully human nature and thus possesses two natures, two wills, and two energies because nature 
or excuse me, energy and will are faculties or properties of nature. So if Christ is fully human and fully divine, then by necessity, he has to have two wills and two nature. If we say something erroneous, such as that will is a faculty of person, how many wills does God have? He would have three. But nobody says that the Trinity has three wills. Nobody, literally. Not any, I've never heard any person say this. Maybe some crazy guy in a strip mall, non-denominational church thinks this, but um, in all Trinitarian theology, nobody has ever proposed that there's three wills in the Trinity. Well, if there's not three wills in the Trinity, then if then that means that will, that will has to be a faculty or property of nature. And if that's the case, and if Christ has two natures, then he has two wills and two energies, you see. So, and it's also important to mention as well that in Christ in the incarnation, the human nature, human will, and human energy are fully deified. That doesn't mean that they cease to be human. They retain their natural properties, right? Both of the natures do. So his humanity can be deified and still be human. Go ahead.